firstly, I just want to thank everyone for coming out here tonight. My name is Julia. I'm on the events team here at Bookstore Magic, which is the independent bookstore just a short walk away from here. Hopefully you've heard of us. And we're super excited for this event tonight. Before we get started, just a few quick, quick housekeeping notes. Firstly, I want to thank St. Anne's for letting us use this really beautiful space. And for all of you out in the audience, we do ask that you keep your masks on during this event and covering both your mouth and nose throughout the duration of the event. At the end of the talk, we are going to be doing an audience Q&A. We'll do a line just right here in the center aisle. So start, start thinking of questions and we'll let you know when to start lining up. Lastly, I know many of you picked up a book when you purchased your ticket, but we do have additional books available for purchase when you checked in and we will be doing a signing line at the end over here. All right, with all of that out of the way, I'm so excited to introduce Emma Straub and Bobby Finger, who are joining us tonight to celebrate the release of Emma's newest book, This Time Tomorrow. <laughs> so just a bit about the book. This Time Tomorrow follows Alice, a woman who goes to sleep on the eve of her 40th birthday and wakes up on her 16th birthday in 1996. It's a love story of a different kind, showcasing Alice's relationship with her father. Emma so perfectly captures in this book what it is to watch a father, and she does so with humor, wisdom, time travel, and as you've probably heard by now, lots of hot dogs. <laughs> this Time Tomorrow is truly such a wonderfully big-hearted book, and we're so excited to have you all here to celebrate it with us tonight. In addition to This Time Tomorrow, Emma Straub is also the New York Times bestselling author of four other novels, all adults here, The Vacationers, Modern Lovers, Laura Lamont's Life and Pictures, and the short story collection, Other People We Married. Her books have been published in 20 countries. She and her husband, hi Mike, own Books Are Magic. And as I mentioned, Emma is gonna be joined in conversation tonight by Bobby Finger, Bobby is a writer and co-host of the popular celebrity and entertainment podcast, Who Weekly. A Texas native, he lives now in Brooklyn, New York, and his debut novel, The Old Place, will be published this fall. All right, so you're not here to see me. Let's all give a very, very warm welcome to Emma. My parents are here, my children are here. If you hear noise, it's probably them. Um, so before Bobby and I talk, um, you are in for a treat. So I have asked my friend Stephen Merritt to sing two songs for you. Um, I have been asking Stephen to sing things for various book-related events of mine for a decade, and it's so nice that he keeps saying yes. Um, so Stephen is going to sing two songs. The first one, I believe, is um, the song, one of the songs that he sang at our wedding. And um, you'll see why it's a perfect wedding song as soon as he sings it. Um, please join me in welcoming Stephen Merritt. Best friend, folks. 
folks can't comprehend the fact that he talks. Vultures and hawks turn white as doves, cause everyone loves my little gargoyle. I found him on a church. He helps with my research. People recoil when they see me. Obviously, I'm pretty extreme. Most people scream most of the time, but always when I'm walking my gargoyle, puddles may boil when we go by my gargoyle and I again. Without fail, I'm wagging my tails, walking my gargoyle, wagging my tails, walking my gargoyle. This song was actually written in the 90s. I think. <laughs> you used to slide down the carpeted stairs or down the banister like a kaleidoscope cause you knew too many words we used to make gingerbread houses we used to have taffy
Okay. Hi. Um, thank you, Bobby. Bobby, Bobby, I'm obsessed with Bobby, everybody, just so you know that up top. I'm a hooligan, and I blurbed his first novel, so I get all the points. Mutual obsession. <laughs> this is also the first time we've ever spoken to each other in person without masks on. I know. Which well, is very weird. Anything could happen. I know. Um, this is so great. Thank you. Your book came out today. My book came out today. Yay! I'm going to because I'll completely crush it for up here. <laughs> Especially if you were like, Sadie Smith has been, has been at an event here. I was like, cool, great, great thing to hear <laughs> right before I go on stage. Um, <laughs> So, I love this book. I love it so much. Um, I'm also a huge sap. That's something about me. <laughs> um, not something I get to like express on my podcast about Meghan Markle all the time. Um, but I'm a huge sap, and so I wanted to start with a story about how and where I finished this novel for the first time. Got it. And I love airplanes. <laughs> I love airplanes, I love airports, I love layovers, I love long flights, I love... What? I know, I love it. I love airplanes, and I finished this in one of my favorite places to finish a book, which is on an airplane. And I cried, because I cry on airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> I, the last pre-pandemic flight that I took, I watched Home Alone, <laughs> and I just sobbed. I've seen Home Alone a million times. And I just think that airplanes are a great place to finish a book. And yeah. do you agree? Bobby, I have a lot of follow-up questions. So wait, you uh, love, your you love air, you, okay, you love airplanes, you love airports, but, and it's because you love crying. No, that's just like, that's like a bullet point underneath <laughs> got it, me got loving it, airplanes. Got it. I really just like being in, you know, airport restaurants and like looking around and wandering and filling up my water bottle and, you know, having a beer at the Buffalo Wild Wings, you know? Um, <laughs> but I was trying to unpack why it is I like finishing books on planes and why they make me cry when I don't typically cry when I read a book or yeah. watch a movie. Yeah. And I googled it and it's like, well, there's low oxygen level. There's a very scientific <laughs> explanation for that. But I was like, that's not good enough for me. Um, I think the thing about it is, if we take the science out of it, I think airplanes are just wonderful places to feel awe. Like, I, th I think it will be hard to be on a plane however cynical you are, however bad your day is, however bad your years have been, and not feel a little bit of awe when you are out there. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the things that your book is about. It's about feeling awe at life, at um, Alice feels awe when she thinks of her father, you know, like she feels awe when she thinks of New York City. Yeah. And then by the end, spoiler alert, she feels awe when she thinks of her own life. Um, I hope that that doesn't like ruin the end of this book for Probably ruined everything. Um, but I feel awe when I think of this book, too. Um, and that's not a question, but that's just how I wanted to start it. Uh, an actual question that I have, again, I have notes because this won't work without them. Um, you've definitely pulled from your life in your past books, for sure. Mm -hmm. I've read them. Yeah. I've listened to other interviews with yeah. you talking about yeah. those books. Yeah. But never as explicitly as with this one. Like, so much so that it's like fully in the marketing for this book, yeah. you know? <laughs> you had a, a profile of yourself that was on the cut that was published today, and it's in the headline. You know, yeah. like, she goes into her past, yeah. you know. Um, is writing a piece of, like, actual autofiction any different than writing your other books? Um, hmm, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think of this as autofiction. Um, I keep calling it my autobiographical time travel novel, so I guess, like, I guess, if I felt like, 15 to 20 percent like hipper. Maybe I would call it autofiction, but I feel like that's just not the place I am in my life. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean, it felt very different. Writing this book felt very different because I, it was truly about me in a way that none of my other books are. You know, I think that I mean, you know, you can you can certainly find. Um, especially if you know me well, like, you can find pieces of me in, in all my books, but, but this one is, is like, you know, you could draw a map of, of parts of my childhood bedroom from this book. You know, it's really, it's all there. Did you mind, did you keep a journal as a teen? 
Like, did you mind the past in any, like, active way when you were prepping for it, or did you just sit down and write? Oh, my God. I mean, like, my friends from high school can tell you. Like, I kept diaries. I mean, it, I don't even know if they were just diaries. I just had notebooks with me always. I started keeping a diary when I was 10, um, and I have them. I have them all. Um, but, yeah, I just, you know, I, that's what I did before, before I had a cell phone. I just wrote constantly. I wrote, you know, about my day or whatever I was feeling. I wrote poems. I wrote like hundreds and hundreds of poems. I was um, obsessive and yeah. And you know, I'm a hoarder from a family of hoarders and I, so I have everything. I have all my yearbooks. I have all my diaries. I have so many photographs. Um, and, and also, like, you know, I should say, we are here right now. This is the room that I graduated from high school in. Um, and I'm not the only one. There are other people in here. Um, but, you know, I'm, like, I exist in, I exist in very, very, very close proximity to my teenage self all the time. Okay. When you... When you thought of the, I guess we'll get to like the actual writing of this book later, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when when you kind of pitch this book to your agent, your editor, coming from a place that's like decidedly not science fiction, was this an easy sell? Like, I'm gonna write a sci-fi time travel book next. Yeah. You know, like, did they say cool, or did they say <laughs> let's take a second and think about this? Well, so the funny thing is, is that I so I had sold a different book, a book that was much you know, had much more in common with, with my previous novels, um, you know, to my, you know, my agent and I had sold it to my editor, who I've worked with for many, many books, Sarah McGrath of the Years Memoir, um, and everything was hunky-dory, and then it was March 2020, and, you know, I was doing first grade at home, and so I wasn't writing, and, you know, Mike was at the bookstore sending things out, so I didn't work on that book for six months, and then by the time I had childcare again in the fall, that book was a stranger to me, um, and I had this other idea, and I did call, I had to call my editor and be like, okay, funny story, now I'm writing a time travel novel. Um, and you know, I mean, she could have said anything, like she could, she definitely could have said, that is not what I paid for. Um, but she didn't. She said, okay, great, let's see, let's see where it goes. And when you were writing, like, uh, the thing about, I'm not really big into science fiction because when I watch sci-fi, especially time travel stuff, like multiverse stuff, I get very caught up in the rules and I'm like, these rules don't make sense to me. I don't get this, this, that doesn't work. I like try to find the plot holes, like it, it's, it's a compulsion. And I'm just not used to it. I didn't yeah. grow up reading sci-fi, I didn't grow up liking it. Like, that's why I like your other books, because families, I know the rules, <laughs> you know, friends, I know the rules, yeah. I get it. So when you were developing the rules of time travel as they exist in your book, how did that come to pass? Yeah. Like, are you a fan of time travel? Oh, I love time travel, I love time You're a fan of time travel? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you know, you would be, maybe you wouldn't be surprised. I, over the last few weeks, like, you know, starting to do interviews for this book, so many people have asked me variations on the question of, like, what is your autobiographical time travel story? And, like, I know it's never what they mean. Like, I know nobody's really asking me about my personal time travel, but that's how the question... I, I mean, maybe they are. Maybe they are. Come talk to me after if you have those secrets. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I loved time travel growing up. I loved Peggy Sue Got Married. Um... <laughs> I was saying this, I would say that, like, I think, I mean, I have seen Peggy Sue got married so many times, and I think that it, it has to be that, like, whoever, like, uh, what's his name, Francis Ford Coppola, like, must have sold Peggy Sue got married to, like, TBS or something, and it was just on television every week. Yeah. Um, because I don't know how I would have seen it really as many times as I think I've seen it. Um, but, you know, Back to the Future, all those you know, like every Keanu Reeves movie. Um, 
I, yeah, I always love time travel. Um, and I was, I was worried about it for myself, like, because, you know, it seems dangerous. It seems like something that you can really get wrong um, and do badly and have, like, people get mad at you on the internet about. Um, but, so what I, I mean, what I did was I read a lot of science, a, a lot of time travel novels and I rewatched all those movies just to get a sense of like, okay, so like, what are what are some of my possibilities? Like, and how, how have other people solved this problem? And then I had a conversation with one of my dad's best buds, who is like a science fiction critic and professor. And I asked him, um, I asked him like how not to mess it up. And he gave me such like good kind advice, which is that I, I didn't have to worry about anything, that all I had to do was make sure that I was following my own rules. Like whatever rules I chose, it didn't matter what they were. As long as I stuck to those parameters, then I would be fine and that you know time travel belongs to all of us and and that it, that nobody would get mad at me. I feel like I, I won't I won't spoil the particulars of the rules of your time travel, but when I got to the rules, I was like, I got it. <laughs> that makes sense to me. I have no issues. And you mentioned Peggy Sue in the book a lot. And you yeah. mentioned Back to, the, Back to the Future is trickier. Back to the Future, you know, the disappearing yeah. face. But like Back, Peggy Sue and Kindred, I think yeah. you mentioned often too. And I think both of those have time travel rules that are kind of very easy to accept. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. like there are no qualms. But like, I get it. I'm yeah. happy with it. Yeah, I wanted it to be as simple as possible because, like, to me, you know, it, I, like, I, that was not what I was interested in. Like, I was not interested in, like, um, I don't know, impressing, like, that particular kind of nerd. Like, that's not me. You never will, by the way. <laughs> this is never going to be right, 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 exactly. I'm not, going, I'm not going to anyway, so, like, I'm not going to waste my time doing that. Um, I just wanted to get to the story. You know, I just wanted it to be about Alice and Leonard and, and New York City and all the things that I knew I could do well, like the things that I felt confident about. This may be a stupid question, but when you were writing it, did it kind of feel like you were writing a multiverse for yourself? Because like everything, like you're like, it's not an autobiographical piece of fiction, like really there are all these changes, but it's like, in this one, my dad writes science fiction, yeah. you know, yeah. like instead of, a, as you, I'm quoting you, my dad is a trillion horror novel, <laughs> what you to me. Yeah. You know, like, did it, did it feel like you were writing an alternative version of yourself? Was that, because it sounds fun? Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, in a way, I think I was like, I just, you know, I wanted to create these characters um, that would, that were these sort of like very, very stripped down versions of us. Um, you know, like Alice is not me and Leonard is definitely not my dad. He like wears terrible clothes. My dad wears great clothes, you know? <laughs> There are other differences too. 95th Street, 85th Street, big differences. Um, but I, but it was, but it was really fun, and like in a, in a really, um, like in a really genuine way, writing this book was like was my time travel because it, you know in I started in, in October of 2020 when I guess we had one. Kaden was in school all the time, and one was in school some of the time, and but you know everything was still very very tight, and and so I wasn't getting out much. Um, I certainly wasn't going to Manhattan, um, or like going to restaurants or walking down the street talking to my dad. You know I wasn't doing any of those things, um, but when I was in my office with my computer inside the world of this book, I could do all of those things. And it was great, you know? I had I had so much fun and I was texting like all of my friends from childhood being like, what what will I kill myself for not including? Like what what can I not forget? Um, and so I was having all these really wonderful, warm conversations with people all the time. Was it a faster process than your last book? Or was it about the same? No. Okay, wait, my publisher told me I can't talk about the fact that I wrote this book quickly. Um, so I'm not going to say that. But I, will, but I will say that 
Um, you know, with, with All Adults Here took me the longest of, of all of my books, in, in part because I, um, because we opened the bookstore. Um, you know, so I took many months off from writing and, and just, you know, I had to, I had to readjust um, in terms of my balance, of, you know, the balance of my days. Um, but this one, I mean, God, I was just laser focused and it was the kind of thing where, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when you are really used to doing your job, you think like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to procrastinate, I'm going to do something else, you know. But when you can't, when you, when, you, when you absolutely are not able to do your job that you love for so long, and all of a sudden you have hours in the day where you can do it, I just, I wrote, I wrote like crazy. That's a, that seems like you won't get your publisher to keep saying, I wrote like crazy. <laughs> I wrote like crazy. Double um, when you first told me about this book in your store, your wonderful store, I've seen you a million times in that store and we've never spoken to each other oh, until really? that day. And um, I said, oh, your book comes out soon. What's it about again? Mm -hmm. And you said, it's about my dad. That's how you described it to me. I did not know it was time travel until later. You said, it's about my dad. And I said, oh, does, does he know? And you said, oh, he's read it four times. <laughs> um, and I just thought that was so kind of like thrilling and surprising to me. Like not only is your dad uh, reading your book four times, it seems like he really likes it. And then I got the galley of it and it didn't have acknowledgments. And so I just got this one. And sure enough, at the end, you thank your father. This doesn't feel like a spoiler. Um, for receiving this book as it was intended, as a gift. And I was like, that's incredible to me. <laughs> um, you, I think you said, I, I, I know that you said that you always known you wanted to be a writer, but did you always know you wanted to write about your dad? No, no, God, no. Did that, did that <laughs> Do you think, like, is that very much like this is your sixth book sort of thing? Like, when did, when did the story of your dad come into your head? Oh, I, I mean, I, I never, I never would have written about it. I mean, I just, like, if you had told me five years ago that I would write this book, I would have laughed. Um, I just, I, it, it, it was just a matter of um, time and circumstance, you know? It was, it was something that, that appeared to me. Um, and, I, I mean, I don't think he... He totally remembers saying this, but but it was we were it was when he was in the hospital in probably September maybe it was or it was, yeah this was probably in September and I was talking about how I couldn't write the book I was writing anymore and I didn't know what I was gonna write and he really said like oh maybe you should write a book about a girl visiting her dad in the hospital. And I was like, no, oh, yeah, no, I think that, that could work, that could work. And I just, it, I just, I, it, it, the rest of it came together so quickly that I don't, that I don't even rem remember it happening, really. You know, it was just like, it was just like, <laughs> and time travel. And time travel. And when you, I mean, it sounds like when you were growing up was, I know that right now you're the one with like, the lights on though, but like when, when you were living, and I guess more in his shadow, like was that something that was intimidating to you, or was it just like a fact of life, or was it inspiring to you? Like, what was it like yeah. to live with someone who was a, you know, a working? Oh, it was writer? great. No, it was great. It was great. He, he made it look very, very good. Uh, <laughs> like, it seemed like a really, like a, like a, like, like one of like the A plus jobs you could have, because he wore, he got like dressed up every day wore fancy outfits and never left the house <laughs> and um, watched soap operas and hung out with us and like read books and hung out with his friends all the time. I don't know, it just seemed, yeah, no, it seemed like professionally, I feel like he made excellent choices and, and um, yeah, it, I mean, I think, you know, what I've learned what I learned from having a like a, a writer dad is that that I
think that like a lot of people that I really sort of became aware of like when I was in my MFA program was that like there were a lot of people who were still like really like thinking about the news or whatever. And and I was like, what are you talking about? Like it's your job. You you have to go and you do it. Like I, I, I think I saw his discipline when it came when it came to his work. Um, and yeah, I don't know. So yes, I, I but I was never intimidated by it. I never thought like, oh, I shouldn't try to do that. <laughs> I feel like I knew I knew that answer after reading yeah. the book, but I kind of heard you say. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's some lines again. I, I just feel like this book is really special, and I don't want to like ruin it for anyone who hasn't read it. But there are a couple lines that really stuck out to me, and I think will keep reverberating. But um, one of them is, "Life is pretty sticky." Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I love that. Life is pretty sticky, and there was another one. Forward is the idea. And I think that those are just very like timeless and yeah. timeless themes. Let's well, call them. That, that was that was the, one of the other things about time travel that that I decided would be true. Mm -hmm. That like you know that Alice can go you know figures out how to go back and forth, but that and and so she can change things about her life, but not that much. Yeah. You know, like it's not like she was like either going to work in her school or she was going to be like a race car driver. <laughs> you know, like it wasn't. Like that, she could she could tweak things, but that it wasn't going to be like a, like a totally 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 different world. Yes, and I I just I really responded to that because I thought there's something incredibly comforting about finding out that it's going to be okay, even if you go to the past and you make some tweaks, like this version of yourself that you end up at after you know you follow the rules that you created, it's going to be fine, and it, that made me think about being in like the darkest days of the pandemic when you are, when like I stopped using Instagram because I couldn't look at mm -mm. what other people were doing because it made me think about, you know, the, the multiverses of myself, like what I could be doing, the regret, you know, because at the same time you're thinking, what's gonna happen in the future? What should I have done in the past that would have made my present a little bit better? And it was like driving me a little crazy. And so because of that, I, I kind of think of this as a pandemic novel. The pandemic is never mentioned. Yeah. But d does that make sense to you? Like, yeah. think of this as a pandemic. I, you novel. know, it's funny. It's it, like uh, we were talking about this earlier today. That like I, I didn't, I didn't until like real like this week. I think I, I never ever ever thought about it as a pandemic novel. I did purposefully, um, you know. So Alice is forty in the book, and she know that she's 16 in 1996, which means that when she's 40, it's 2020. And, but I, I didn't want to make it about the pandemic, but I think that I, I, I mean, I did, I, I think I did anyway, um, which is, I don't know, it's sort of satisfying to me in a, in a funny way, because I, you know, I think all books obviously are like products of the, of the time in which they were made. Um, Julia's giving, giving me a little, a little look that's like, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. Um, you know, it's, so it is, it is a 2020 book, so it is a pandemic book, um, but yeah, I think I like, I think by leaving the pandemic part of it out and sort of just letting your brain fill it in, um, it feels, it feels good. Julia, one more question, is that fine? Um, just to wrap it up, just for something fun, you can't read, I mean, this is the, this can be said about all of your books, but you can't read this book specifically without thinking, well, I see, I see the movie, I see it. <laughs> Not a limited series, yeah. a movie, yeah. right? Yes. I know that movie budgets can be tricky things, I don't want to pretend to know like the inner workings of Hollywood, but let's say yeah. this movie's happening, yeah. and they're like, Emma, you have great ideas, and I love the soundtrack of your dreams in yeah. this movie, but we can only afford one great 90s or pre 90s song. Oh which god. is it? Oh my god. Which Jason, is the 90s Jason, song that you, I answer this? that you, you know, just throw the entire budget at? Oh my god, this is really hard. If anyone in the audience who's like a movie director has any ideas, just shout out. Um, I don't know. God. Did you, did you have one? What is it? Oh, it's a hard one. 
<sighs> okay, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess, like, give me a Mariah Carey at a really good moment. Give me, give me a good Mariah Carey moment. Yeah, that's expensive. I bet. <laughs> That'll work. I bet. You get one Mariah Carey. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> to be determined, Mariah yeah. Carey. Cool. Um, so is this? Is yes. This okay. So if you have, if anyone has questions, Julie is moving a microphone. My children are allowed to ask questions if they want, but only one. Okay, Ruby. Yes, okay, so River, River wants credit. River wants credit for his, his contribution. This is the book. So River and I don't know if everyone can hear him. It, it, he was having he was doing his remote school downstairs and he came up to my office and asked me what I was doing on his lunch break. And um, and I was writing a scene, it's Alice and Leonard are in the kitchen and he's having breakfast and River was like, he should also have an Oreo. And I said, you're right. Thank you, Ribby. I appreciate it. Yes, I would. Thank you. Both on one. Hi, Brian. Hello, congratulations. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if you read any science fiction stories. Or if there's any science fiction media that made you feel like that is the exact opposite of how I want time travel to work. <laughs> and we, from, from which time travel stories did you run in the opposite direction? Oh, that's a, that, that is a, I, is that question going to get me in trouble with the science fiction community? <laughs> Um, thank you, Brian. Uh, well, I, get, I, I will say, um, you know, there were certain things that felt just like, like headier than I wanted to do, like um, Ted Chang's uh, story collection was recommended to me, and I read that, and I was like, okay, I get, I get, I get it, but this is, you know, a different, a different kind of brain. And people it, like kept recommending the movie Primer to me, which also I couldn't I couldn't handle. So apologies to those people. I feel terrible now. Hello. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm Andy. Um, I have a question for you. When it comes to writing sci-fi, that's a new genre for you. Do you feel like now you feel more open to writing other genres, including maybe horror? <laughs> Um, thank you, Andy, for the question. I think my dad went to the bathroom. It's too bad because he would LOL at the idea of me writing horror. Um, no, I, 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 you know, I, I really, I, I, definitely not horror right now. Who knows? I mean, there are other things. Like in my 20s, in my 20s, I tried to write a mystery novel that was <laughs> very bad. It was like a very bad Patricia Highsmith rip off um but that would be fun to go back to like i could try that again you know i mean i love to read romance i could try that um but yes i i, I will say that this book this book did did make me feel like 
you know, it's I'm not too um, old and grizzled to, to try something new. Thank you. Maya? No. <laughs> it's okay, River can ask one more question if you want to. What are you trying to do next? Oh, Ruby! That's the perfect question! I don't know! I don't know, is the answer. them with Riverhead. <laughs> Miles, Miles, do you want to ask one? Oh, yes, I would definitely put my book in a treasure chest. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> um, if nobody else has any questions, I think um, we're just going to thank you for coming. Thank you so much. It's so nice to have this in person again. Oh my God. Thank <laughs> you.